It's Monday, and that so happens to be the day that I like to talk about monsters. Hello, and welcome to Monster Mondays. I am Jeff Arbuckle, co-host of the podcast Film Seizure, that you can catch each Wednesday at FilmSeizure.com or at a number of podcast providers online. Bert I. Gordon, his initials spell big, and that's what made him a giant in 50s and 60s drive-in cinema. Sadly, Gordon passed away just a couple of months ago at the age of 100. And surprisingly, he really hasn't gotten much attention here on Monster Mondays. Oh, sure, his work influenced a lot of stuff, and a lot of that stuff probably did appear on this show, but none of his movies have ever appeared here. So let's fix that in maybe one of the worst ways possible with one of his lesser-liked later films. Yeah, to introduce ourselves to Bert I. Gordon, I'm looking at one of the two films he made out of Elements, of the food of the gods that is a uh, hg wells story now the second one the one we're going to talk about this week is named directly after that story uh but his first attempt to adapt some of wells's story came about 11 years earlier with village of the giants now that's a pretty wild movie that i have seen thanks to mystery science theater 3000 that is part kind of thriller part teenage comedy part hg wells adaptation starring Bo bridges and a young ronnie howard and a small appearance by pop singer and professional dancer tony basil now where gordon really made his splash was between about 1954 and 1960 and during those years he cranked out monster movies like Uh, Serpent Island, King Dinosaur, The Cyclops, The Amazing Colossal Man, Beginning of the End, Earth vs. the Spider, War of the Colossal Beast, and Attack of the Puppet People. In 1960, he made a different kind of thriller with Tormented, which is another classic from MST3K, but one that I actually find to be a really good movie starring Richard Carlson of Creature from the Black Lagoon fame. Now, you might have noticed one thing that... uh, that kind of came with the titles of those movies that I listed off from the 50s. Gordon's movies often had some sort of effect that featured someone or something of a larger size than the majority of the characters. King Dinosaur had, well, a dinosaur. The Cyclops, The Amazing Colossal Man, and War of the Colossal Beast featured a person who was grown large and became a rampaging beast. Um, On the opposite end of that is Attack of the Puppet People, who had small people dealing with everything else being supersized. Uh, Earth vs. the Spider was about a giant spider. Beginning of the End was about giant grasshoppers. Now, later on, he scaled back the large monsters, but as he moved into the mid to late 70s, he made this week's feature that has animals ingesting what might just be the mythical food of the gods, and making them large and followed it up a year later with another hg wells adaptation of empire of the ants that features well giant ants now we'll bookmark that second one because uh, that will be making an appearance on the show in a few weeks now as for the people in this movie um the film is headed up by marjo gortner who was a bit of a leading man at this time Gortner's fame began at an early age when he was a child evangelist preacher. He became the subject of a documentary in the early 70s called Marjo. Gortner eventually kind of rebelled against his career as a preacher and became pretty sour at his parents and the life that they kind of thrust upon him. He ended up becoming an actor where he appeared in in a TV movie called Pray for the Wildcats, where he co-starred with William Shatner, Robert Reed, and Andy Griffith. And later, he would be in one of the all-time great bad Italian rip-off movies, Star Crash. Additionally, in this, we have uh, Ida Lupino playing Mrs. Skinner, who uh, is uh, an old farmer's wife who discovered the supposed food of the gods where eventually animals begin to ingest it. Now, she had a long career in showbiz, having racked up a ton of credits in a nearly 50-year career. She appeared on just about every popular TV series uh, from the late 50s into the late 70s, in addition to her film career. And she also directed movies, which uh, most of which were made between 1949 and 1953. 
So she's kind of an early example of a popular female actress transitioning to directing. And finally, we have, uh, in a smaller part, Belinda Belaski, who is uh, probably best known in for appearing in Joe Dante films like Piranha, The Howling, Gremlins 1 and 2, Matinee, another film that features giant bugs, Small Soldiers, and Nightmare Cinema. All right, so... Our tale opens with Morgan, played by Marjo Gortner, who is a pro football player. Now, he and a couple of his teammates are heading by ferry to an island, um, and I believe this is uh, off the coast of British Columbia, I think it's mentioned. Now, they're told to go there to relax for a few days before a big game. The trio hunt a deer for dinner, but... Um, Morgan ultimately lets the deer go, thinking it's no sense in continuing to chase down the innocent young deer. However, when one of those teammates chased the deer into the woods, his horse becomes startled by a strange sound heard in the trees. The rustling is the sound of huge wasps that begin to sting the man, and he eventually dies from the large number of stings he suffered from a large by a large number of large wasps. Um, By the time Morgan finds him, the wasps have all dispersed. Now, Morgan finds the cabin of the Skinners. Now, Mrs. Skinner, who I said was played by uh, Ida Lupino, hurries inside when she sees him coming out of the woods and refuses to answer the door. He hears a noise in the barn and discovers a giant rooster that begins attacking him. And he's only saved when he uses a pitchfork to stab the rooster in the throat. The rooster isn't the only large beast in the barn either. Turns out the chickens are pretty massive too. Mrs. Skinner finally reveals herself and um, she doesn't have a phone to use to call about his dead friend. But she begs Morgan to look at something. She shows him two large rat holes where she basically stashes their food and grain for themselves and for the animals on the farm. She worries that maybe rats have gotten uh, into this place and to this mysterious stuff that she labels FOTG and believes it came from the Lord to help feed their animals. However, it's only made them larger along with uh, the wasps that killed Morgan's buddy. Also, there is Mrs. Skinner's husband, Mr. Skinner, who went to the mainland previously and is returning home. Now, as he's coming back, uh, Mrs. Skinner is at home alone and worried about what this miracle growth stuff is possibly doing to the animals around the farm. And she gets her hands uh, chewed up quite a bit by giant grubs that have gotten into uh, this mysterious goop. That night, Mr. Skinner is pulled over on the side of the road fixing a flat tire when those rats that Mrs. Skinner feared got in and fed on her uh, FOTG reveal that they are pretty freaking huge now and attack and eat Mr. Skinner. Now, Morgan gets his other teammate, Brian, back to the mainland, but both eventually decide to return to the island to check it out and to figure out what's going on here and what led to their friend's death. However, there are more characters uh, getting introduced in this second act. We meet a young couple, Thomas and Rita, and a dog food company owner, Jack, and his assistant, who is also a bacteriologist named Lorna. Now, Jack and Lorna are there to buy meal stuffs from the Skinners to market in their dog food. And Lorna and Jack first see the giant chickens and and a busted out barn door and they don't seem all that bothered by seeing giant dead chickens even though uh, they do know that uh, about something that has made these farm animals at the Skinner's larger but Lorna is bothered by the giant grubs that are dead in the kitchen and um, that's when Mrs. Skinner comes out and shows them this oozy stuff that, that kind of looks like yogurt coming out of the ground um, by way of, of kind of oozing out of this little mound on their property. Now, realizing that this stuff wasn't oil, the Skinners fed the stuff to the chickens. The grown chickens ate it, but were unaffected. The chicks grew large and eventually ate the full-grown chickens, so this gunk apparently changes and enlarges 
immature animals. Now, Jack and Lorna are about to leave uh, the farm when they see the giant wasps. And Jack tries fighting them off, but Morgan and Brian arrive to kill these things or to help, basically help uh, Jack kill these giant wasps. Now, on the way there, um, Morgan and Brian were told by Rita that she and Thomas wrecked their camper after trying to avoid a giant rat that was in the middle of the road. Morgan and Brian decide to uh, help them out and take them back to the ferry and everything once they kind of finish up business at the farm. And, uh, and while they're at the farm, Morgan and Brian decide to exterminate the uh, giant wasps. Now, they need to find the, uh, the nest that the wasps have built and the pair of football players are going to blow it up, basically. Now, they are relatively successful in blowing up the nest with relatively no problem. So I guess the wasps are no longer an issue. Mrs. Skinner shows up and tells the guys that the giant rats um, appear to have taken Lorna into a little rat hole in the ground. And Morgan and Brian save her by literally blowing the giant's rat's brains out. Now, this is <laughs> shooting the rats might actually be the best effect in this entire movie. At first, I thought they were really killing real mice and rats with like maybe like little BB gun shots or something, uh, but it actually isn't. Um, if you are able to look at this frame by frame on a DVD, um, you'll see that they're actually shooting a, a squirt of red stuff at a high enough velocity that's knocking the mice and rats over and also splattering as if it was like a gunshot. So it's actually a fairly decent effect in a movie that has some not so great effects. Uh, but I really did think at first they were killing real mice and rats to get those shots, but that's actually not the case. Uh, it was just a high powered squirt gun essentially. Now Rita and Thomas are attacked by the rats, uh, but they do escape and make their way to the Skinner farm. And Jack makes it clear that he wants to take his car and anyone else who want to leave and basically make a run for it. But he's thwarted by Morgan, who tells him that he's going to make sure it's okay to even try to leave before they attempt to leave. Um, because the rats are basically everywhere and they're slowly taking over this little island. And Morgan thinks that if they can somehow lead the rats into, uh, basically, there's like this pond on this island um, that he thinks that the rats will ultimately drown. You see, they know how to swim, when, especially when they are normal sized, but in their new giant forms, they will have to learn all over again on how, how to swim, and they may be too heavy to teach themselves. So it's very possible that it will end poorly for most of these rats. However, it turns out that only some drown. There are too many and some of the rats end up hanging back to shut off a generator that Morgan set up to electrify a fence to basically box the rats in and force them toward that pond or toward that deep water where they would eventually drown. Um, and which is also kind of crazy that they have these, uh, that they have the know how that this generator is electrifying this fence that was hurting and killing some of them and forcing them back to the water. It's, it's kind of crazy that they, that they actually know that sort of stuff and that they're smart enough about it, but you never see anything more about it. But, um, so trying to fend off the sneaky rats who were waiting for them at the fence, Brian is ultimately swarmed by the rats and is killed. Meanwhile, back at the farm, Jack is greedily trying to scoop up as much of the white goo that makes everything bigger, and Rita is having complications with her pregnancy. And after the rats invade the Skinner farm, Jack is killed after getting all of his jars of white goop smashed by Morgan in a fit of rage. Thomas decides that all Morgan seems to be doing is putting them at even greater risk, so he kind of wants to take Jack's car and leave with Rita before she has a miscarriage. But Mrs. Skinner actually calms him down by 
saying that being on a farm, she knows a thing or two about delivering babies, and both he and Rita decide to stay until it's safe to leave. While fighting back the rats, Lorna asks Morgan to make love to her because she likes his moxie and she doesn't think they're going to make it out alive. So, uh, But he feels pretty confident uh, they're going to continue this conversation once they get back to the mainland. But at one point, Morgan and Thomas get in Morgan's Jeep to set explosions to blow up a dam to basically wash out the rats. This allows the rats to get into the Skinner's farmhouse where they kill Mrs. Skinner. Um, Lorna and Rita barricade themselves in the bedroom and that's when Rita's baby decides to be born right there on the spot while giant rats are trying to get in and eat them. Now Morgan and Thomas get back and save uh, Lorna and Rita and the baby as the flood comes in and washes the rats and washes out the rats and drown them. There is still one that survives. Uh, something that's only brought up briefly and you see him a few times but there's an albino rat that seems to be like the coordinator and the leader of all the other rats so morgan has to beat that one over the head with his empty shotgun once the flood somehow rescinds morgan and thomas pile all the dead rats up into a pile uh and lorna pours one of the f2 fotg jars onto them And they burn the beasties in a bonfire. And I guess they're having rat for supper tonight. However, as a final stinger, it turns out some of the goop jars that Mrs. Skinner had saved got washed away and ended up at a mainland farm where cows drank it and their tainted milk ended up in school kids' lunchroom milk. And... uh, it's heavily implied that those kids are going to end up having abnormal growth. So let's get to the three things that I like about the food of the gods. The first thing has to be the absolutely nonchalant reactions to seeing things get so big. Okay, granted, Marjo Gortner is pretty freaked out when he gets attacked by a giant cock, as you do. But once he knows that there are giant things, he reacts absolutely not at all... Uh, at basically seeing a 10 foot tall wasp nest it's just like a normal thing to him he's just it, it, he reacts n- n- with nothing he just looks at it, it's like yeah there it is that's what we're looking for uh he finds out his teammate died of what would basically be 200 wasp stings and he's like those sons of bitches are obviously giant and then he goes with a plan to blow them up now why did he blow them up it's like he's exacting revenge against the giant wasp but why i mean between him (laughs) returning to the island uh leaving his pro football team practice early to do so no less uh to deal with the monsters that killed his buddy when it has nothing to do with where he lives what he does in basically his day-to-day life uh but out of sheer machismo to punch out uh, you know, to, to punch out of control nature right in the face and how people react to giant worms, giant chickens, giant wasps and giant rodents you know you are in a pretty bad creature feature and it becomes this kind of quaint thing um, you know this is a movie that's made somewhere between 15 and 20 years too late people don't act like people from 1976 in this movie it's almost naive in how they deal with these giant creatures it's like they believe this is all possible just because something like that goop is a thing that just exists you know once the atomic age began giant monsters did happen because of course they would exist simply due to radiation so some normies might react negatively to this concept when they see these things but the heroes who in those movies back in the 50s and very early 60s were usually scientists um they just kind of end up accepting this stuff as if oh yeah radiation yeah that's gonna happen that's a thing in this movie scientists are not the heroes but all these people in the food of the gods just kind of accept giant animals like the scientists accepted that stuff in the 50s i mean that's just some really classic cheesy creature feature business going on there 
Now, second, speaking of classic cheesy creature feature business, you have a couple of old effects going on here. The first is the use of miniatures. You have normal sized rats crawling over small scaled camper trucks, for example. You have a miniature version of the Skinner's farm for the rats to crawl over. This is fairly classic stuff. We've seen this in everything from Godzilla to Night of the Lepus to stuff like Beginning of the End with grasshoppers crawling over scaled down Chicago buildings. It's always adorable and fun to see miniatures and normal sized things like mice and rats crawling over them. The other classic effect is the reaction from superimposed or projected shots of these animals in close up to look larger than the actors. This is always kind of a bad effect if done cheaply, and brother, is it done cheaply in this movie. It's as I said previously, the movie feels 15 to 20 years too late. By 1976, when this was released, we had already seen what special effects could be with movies like 2001. Star Wars hadn't come out yet, and this movie looked poorly made in the effects department. It may seem like I'm picking on this movie, but honestly, I'm not. Between The Food of the Gods in 1976 and The Empire of the Ants in 1977, both from Bird Eye Gordon, uh, both based on H.G. Wells' books, um, these feel like the last movies of an era that began in the early 50s when pop culture began to shift away from the monsters and things that go bump in the night and turn toward these kind of new age terrors that push scientific minds to use smarts instead of brawn to save the day. Uh, the movie looks of its time. I mean, it looks like a movie that takes place and is being shot and, and being acted in the mid 70s, but it plays out and uses movie making techniques that are from a bygone age. This is a giant monster movie in the time of space exploration. It really does feel like watching a definitive end of an era, and it makes this movie more of a curiosity than a truly bad movie. Lastly, I've said this feels like a movie that should have come out in the late 50s. I've said that a lot already. Well, that's mostly true, but there is an unusual amount of melodrama in this for a giant rat and wasp and chicken and grub movie. That's where this kind of then ends up becoming something of a 70s monster movie. We've got a young couple arguing over getting married while one is pregnant and didn't opt to get an abortion. That was a scene I didn't mention earlier, but uh, it's because it was just kind of shoved into this movie. Rita wants the classic kid and family and husband, and Thomas doesn't seem to be comfortable with any of that. And you've already got a greedy dog food company owner who is like a hyper-capitalist who doesn't really give a shit about anyone else in this situation. He just wants his goop and to get out of there alive. His assistant, Lorna, is something of a feminist without it actually coming out and saying that. Um, she makes mention how she settles for working with the greedy dog food company owner because she followed what she was interested in, bacteria, and she's a lady, so her chances aren't that plentiful to get a job in that field. She calls the capitalist a whore for money when he implies that she would do anything for money too, which may or may not have been uh, kind of indicated that he thinks that she did whore herself at, you know, for money at some point. But then Lorna just point blank asks Morgan to make love to her because, hey, why not? They're all going to die anyway. But then you have Mrs. Skinner, and she never had a scene with Mr. Skinner. She always talks about Mr. Skinner. He's the one who will do the business with the goop. When she realizes that he's likely died before returning from the mainland, she starts talking about how unafraid of death she really is because she'll uh, get to be with her husband again. That isn't saying she is no longer fighting to stay alive. It's just that if they are going to die, she's not scared of it. And it's kind of sad, but it also makes her maybe the most even keeled person in this whole cast. There's always room for a little bit of melodrama in these creature features, but Gordon kind of evenly distributes monster time and drama time. It's, um, it's the only element of this movie that feels like it was contemporary for the mid-70s. Well, that wraps up 
this week's Monster Mondays, you can catch new episodes of Monster Mondays each Monday at FilmSeizure.com. Don't forget to follow Film Seizure at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And subscribe to Film Seizure to get both the Film Seizure podcast and Monster Mondays at your favorite podcast providers as well as YouTube. You can also check out my website, bmovieanima.com, to read new articles every Friday morning. Next time, let's continue to look at the Ecology Strikes Back scenario uh, with an earlier film that came out prior to this one, and that's Frogs from 1972. So until next week, stay spooky.